Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Okay, it's sort of conventional to say, my name's Alistair. But I think you all know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my job's to um, carry on the second session on uh, Galatians this morning. Um, Tim, a couple of weeks ago, did the first uh, issue of that. Um, and... By way of starting, I'll tell you that I've just been reading an interesting book. It's by a man called Giles Fraser, and it's called Chosen. And the subtitle there, if you can't read it, is Lost and Found Between Christianity and Judaism. Now, Giles Fraser was canon chancellor, whatever that might be, of St. Paul's Cathedral in London um, in um, 2011. And if you remember, that was the time when the Occupy movement was staging demonstrations uh, all over the world, including in London, and they staged a large demonstration on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, You know, lots of hairy people and banners and things. You can see the picture there. Um, And uh, Fraser got into trouble because um, he wouldn't allow the police to clear the demonstrators from the cathedral steps. And he also actually invited them into the cathedral. What a radical thing to do, to invite people into a church. At any rate, he got into trouble with the um, cathedral authorities. Um, He resigned. He came close to a nervous breakdown. His marriage broke up. And he was casting around for a new post within the Anglican church. And he was... Um, in Liverpool, um, about to be interviewed for a new job there, and he walked into a synagogue. And by strange chance, 
on the wall of the synagogue, here's a portrait of a man who was his grandfather's brother. That's right. So he had a Jewish background, Fraser, although his family was not neither Jewish nor Christian. The, the Jewishness was through his father's line, which, as you know, doesn't make you fully Jewish. But he had a Jewish background. Um, and as, as a result of that experience, he explored his Jewish roots a lot. He married a Jewish woman, and he gave uh, the child of that marriage a Christian baptism in the River Jordan. You begin to see the, the convoluted connections here. Um, the book rambles a bit, I have to say. Um, he, he admits that it was written as self-therapy. But it does give some fascinating... Um, and they talk about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, titled, Can We Recover the Jewish Jesus? Now, I have to say to you, the next slide you may find shocking. Jesus wasn't a Christian, okay? Paul wasn't a Christian, nor was Peter, nor John, nor Barnabas, or any of those folk. They were Jewish. They were seriously Jewish. We had met those people back in those days, in the early days of Christianity. Remember, they were worshipping in the temple every day. They would have appeared to us Jewish, 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 Jewish. Remember how horrified Peter was uh, at the idea that he should eat unclean food when the, the sheet was lowered down to show, take Peter and eat. Not me, I'd never. Would. And then he was to go to Cornelius, a Gentile, to go into his house. Horrifying for a Jew to have fellowship with a Gentile. They were um, seriously Jewish. And there were amongst the early Jesus believers uh, those who thought that the new converts outside of Judaism ought to be brought into the Jewish fold. And that meant the whole lock, stock and barrel. It meant circumcision, it meant the festivals, it meant the food laws, it meant all the things of the Jewish tradition um, that should be added on to Christianity. And that was the cultural context of that red-hot letter. Um, and, and Tim, two weeks ago, was telling us how outraged Paul was at the idea that the, the Galatian Christians should turn around so quickly. So what we're going to do now is just go through the second half of that chapter and, and look at a couple of issues that I think it raises. But first of all, just put yourself in those Galatians' shoes for a moment. They had heard and gladly received the gospel as preached by um, a Jewish chap called Paul. And they had very few other resources when Paul had gone away. They might have had the Old Testament scriptures. They certainly didn't have the New Testament scriptures. They didn't have any commentaries, didn't have any uplifting books. They couldn't even go to Wikipedia to look up this chap, Paul, to find out who he was. Okay? And so there they are working out what does it mean? How, do we, how are we going to run this, this new faith that, that we've been exposed to? And along comes this heavyweight group from Jerusalem, from head office, apparently from the big three, um, Peter, James, and John, telling them that uh, not only must they do what Paul was, had told them, but they had to take on all the rest of the trappings of Judaism. Oh, is that right? Gosh. Well, you know, we're, we're committed to following Jesus. If you say so, I guess, yes, that's what we've got to do. Okay? Now, I may have overstated the, the heavyweight group there from Jerusalem <laughs> a little bit. But, but they do tell us that Paul was not an impressive person. He was probably short, bandy-legged, might have had a speech impediment. Um, you know, he wasn't physically uh, impressive. So how were they to choose those poor Galatians? Um, 
you'd have to have some sympathy for them uh, that they so quickly deserted what it was that Paul had told them. So what Paul's doing now in the rest of the letter is uh, embarking on his defense of his message. And I have to say that I found the way in which he did it a bit surprising um, because, Pache Allen, um, what he did was to um, not to put up a list of authorities. You know, if I was going to defend a point of view, I'd say, well, this person says so, this person says so, this person says so, so it must be right. Paul didn't say that at all. Paul was very much at pains to claim that his gospel was entirely original, that it came through him and nobody else. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. It's a sol he starts with a very solemn statement. When he says, I want you to know, brothers, it's a bit like Jesus saying, um, you have heard that it was said, something or nothing, but I say. So it was, it was a, a phrase that said, you know, this is going to be important what I'm telling you now. And what he's doing is the exact opposite of what I just said. He's not lining up a whole lot of supporters to uh, his point of view. He's claiming that he had it straight from Jesus himself. And as Timothy George says in his Galatians commentary, Paul here claimed an unmediated divine authority for the gospel he proclaimed, an assertion that would be utterly preposterous were it not true. Um, it's an all-or-nothing approach. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, God has told me that I've got to do something, yeah, little alarm bells ring a little bit. You think, well, I've got to be really, really sure that you're right if you're telling me that God has, has told me to do something. Now, it is a bit frustrating because we don't know exactly what it was that the de delegation from Jerusalem had been saying about Paul. But it seems that you know, reading between the lines and reading Paul's letters is sometimes a bit like listening to one side of a telephone conversation because you don't know what stimulated the letter exactly. But it seems that they were implying that Paul had learned his message from other people, probably in Jerusalem, but had got it wrong or had got it only partly right. So what Paul is at pains to point out in this letter now is that he could never have learned the gospel from someone else. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul is trying to show that his gospel is something completely new. There was nothing in his old life that would suggest that he would accept the gospel of Jesus or that he had been in contact with the apostles and had been trained by them. Quite the opposite, in fact. Intensely, extremely, beyond many Jews of my old age, they're all superlatives used to show that he was completely opposed to the gospel. Um, and indeed, he was strongly um, zealous for, quote, the traditions of my fathers. It was a saying of the rabbis, apparently. You've got it there. The scriptures are water, the Mishnah wine, but the Gemara spiced wine. The, the Mishnah and Gemara are the sayings alongside scripture that make up the Talmud, the traditions of the Jews. And the implication is that the rabbis felt that the, the Talmud, the Mishnah plus the Gemara, were the, the important stuff. The scriptures were there, but we've added and we've added and we've added to the scriptures. These are the traditions of the fathers that Paul was keen to defend. Which just made a little bell went off while I was thinking about that and wondering whether do we have um, texts parallel to the scriptures? Islam does. You know, there are a lot of books that are parallel to the, the, the Quran, which Islamic scholars take very seriously. Judaism does, there's the Old Testament and then there's the Talmud. Is there anything equivalent in Christianity? I, pardon? <laughs> yes, well, for a small minority. I, I, I thought the only possible thing might be a, a, a papal encyclical, you know, something that the word of the Pope. 
ex cathedra from the from the top. But there's nothing really, I think, in, in the Protestant side of the church. You know, even the works of Luther or Calvin or something like that, they're, they're of interest to us, but we don't accord them anything like the same weight as scripture. Sola scriptura, said, said Luther, exactly. Okay, so that was Paul before the events on the Damascus Road. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Paul's life turned upside down, back to front, over and over, completely turned around from being the persecutor of the, the, the Christians to being the greatest of their missionaries. Surely that's evidence that, that what his experience on the Damascus Road was something immensely powerful. Uh, and he's appealing to that and saying, so my message is true. And after his experience, he didn't seek out anyone to advise or train him. Again, Pacha Allen, I think what, what, An what Ananias did was simply to uh, pray with him. The scales fell from his eyes. Jesus then goes off uh, and tries to work out what all this means. Um, he went off into Arabia. Now, Arabia was the, the country of the Nabataeans and included beautiful Petra. It is conceivable that, that Paul went to Petra, a place I'd love to go to, and, and stood there and, and preached, honed his gospel, preached his gospel there. The, the, what Paul is saying here doesn't quite fit with um, uh, the Luke's account in Acts, but doesn't really matter very much. Luke wasn't writing a diary, and, and the point that Paul is, only point that he's making, is that he didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't um, get alongside the other apostles. And it does raise the question, well, where did, where did he get the message from? Did it all happen in that flash on the road? Did it happen in the three days while his eyes were covered in scales? Or possibly was Paul well accounted with Jesus' teaching because he may even conceivably have heard Jesus preach. He could have been in Jerusalem or, or somewhere, grinding his teeth, listening to this upstart Messiah claimant. Um, well, we don't know. But after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing you is no lie. Finally, three years later, Paul does go to Jerusalem, but it wasn't to get his doctrine straight. It was to get to know Peter. Um, he wanted to hear firsthand from Peter about the Lord. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? you know, imagine the opportunity of spending two weeks with Peter to hear all about uh, his time with Jesus. He also met James at that time, no doubt collected more stories about, about the Lord. But he stresses that he didn't meet any of the other apostles. Wonder why? Were they away? Were they still not quite trusting of this person, you know, who had been the great persecutor? But Paul lays really heavy emphasis, emphasis, that verse 20. I assure you before God that what I'm writing is no lie. That's, you know, that's heavy stuff. He's really laboring the point. Maybe it's possible that some of the other apostles were associated with the Judaizers, the people who wanted to bring the Christians into the Jewish fold. Maybe that's why he says it so strongly. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. He's laboring the point that he was not tied to Peter or any other of the leaders. In fact, he worked independently and a long way away, the other side of the Mediterranean, preaching his own gospel. And um, 
even though he was, uh, didn't spend time amongst the believers in Judea, they had heard of what he was doing. They were astounded that the persecutor was now the missionary, and they praised God. And that's the passage. That's Paul's defense of his message. We can, we can summarize it. This is Timothy, um, Timothy George again for his, co- his commentary. This is the summary of Paul's message. I received my gospel directly from Jesus Christ, not from any human sources. I only visited Jerusalem sometime after my conversion and then only for a short time to get acquainted with Peter. Far from being a clone of the apostles or a protege of the churches they established in Judea, I was hardly even known to most Christians there. But when they did hear of what God was doing through me, they praised and glorified him on that account. I was no embarrassment to the church in Jerusalem nor to the brothers and sisters in Judea. Rather, through the grace of God, I was the cause of their rejoicing. Paul's defense of his message. Remember, he's red hot that that the Galatians should not depart from what he had told them. Now, a couple of things, you know, as you're reading through these, a couple of things struck me, issues. um, One less, perhaps, directly than the other. Um, The first thing that that struck me, perhaps because I've been reading Giles Fraser's book, was about anti-Semitism. Dreadful things, dreadful, dreadful things have been done to Jewish people down through the ages by Christians as a result of what they think they've read in Paul's writings. Just by coincidence, I've been reading a book about colour, fascinating, uh, um, all about the history of dyes and colours and things. And I learned that in 1492, the entire Jewish population of Spain was expelled from the country. About a quarter of a million people were told, you can't stay here any longer, out. They were given four months' notice to leave the country, to be cast out into the Mediterranean, to try and find somewhere sympathetic, somewhere else. Um, A couple of years, or a few years ago now, Jean and I were in York, a fine town in England, where you can find the old castle. It's called Clifford's Tower now, but it was the old Mott and Bailey Castle, a mound, and originally had a wooden Um, castle on the top of it. That was the site of a massacre of 150 Jews who took refuge there because some guy in the town had stirred up a mob uh, because he owed a Jewish banker money. They set fire to the tower. Most of the Jews inside it died. A few escaped, promising to convert to Christianity, but the mob beat them to death anyway. You you see, those are just little fragments of what's happened to Jewish people down through the years. We think of the Holocaust, but I reckon if you were to put together all of the things that have been done to Jewish people over the years, they would outnumber the Holocaust. It's appalling to think of. And appalling to think that these things have been done too often under some sort of Christian umbrella. Let's not say in the name of Christ. When, remember, once again, Jesus was Jewish. Paul was Jewish. They were all Jewish. Um, when Paul speaks heatedly about the Jews, he doesn't mean Jews as a race, Jews as a culture. He means those Jews who were trying to drag the Christians back from a, a justification by faith sort of gospel to a justification by works, by obeying the law, by doing all that stuff sort of a gospel. There's no mandate in what Paul wrote for any persecution of the Jews. That interface between Christianity and Judaism needs lots of exploration, and I don't know very much about it. Um, If you do chase up that unbelievable uh, video, um, you can hear from Professor Levine, who is, she's a Jewish lady, but she teaches in a Christian university. She teaches um, ministry students about Jewishness and about the Jewishness of Jesus, which is an interesting idea. You know, how would she go teaching in a, in a Christian institution? She's a great lady. She's very, very good to listen to. We, we do need to remember that Christianity is not something original. It sprang from Judaism. Uh, and, and to understand it, I, I think I need to understand the Jewish background a whole lot more. The other issue that, that came to me from reading this passage is how to judge. How do you make, how would those Galatians, how are they to decide 
between Paul and the guys who came from Jerusalem. In his uh, commentary on um, Galatians, Alan Cole says, and it's worth looking at this a bit, it's not the status of the messenger that validates the message, rather the nature of the message itself which validates the messenger. Okay? So Paul's saying, don't look at me, don't look at them and their fancy stuff and their reputations. Look at the message itself. And if you think the message is right, then accept it. Um, Paul's going to plead later on in Galatians um, with the Galatians that they, um, they look at the message, they look at what they received from the, the Holy Spirit, they look at those fruits of the Spirit which are now manifest in them as the validation of his message rather than the, the works message of the Judaizers. It's a message, it's, a, it's an issue for us, of course, today. All sorts of people are giving us messages. We're getting messages from all directions. How do we choose? Um, I'm not actually sure that always it, it, we look at the message. I think sometimes we do look at the messenger too, and I think I've got justification for that from Jesus himself. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? They've got to, they've got to play off the message and the messenger. We do need to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. On the one hand, we shouldn't be cynics who reject everything, you know, who are so know-all that everything gets thrown out. On the other hand, we've got to be alert to the possibility that there are people out there who want to deceive us. I think we've got to test both the message and the messenger. So there we go. There's Paul defending his gospel. And we'll go on in Galatians and, and, and look more at his defense. Let's pray now. Father, we thank you that there is a message. Uh, that there is a message from you to us. Uh, and the message is about yourself, uh, about the sort of God that you are. And the message is Jesus. Uh, what he said, what he did, um, that's a message and a messenger that we can trust uh, with all of our hearts. Help us to be wise about the other messages and messengers that we see coming at us in all directions. Uh, and, and thank you for, for Paul and for his, um, his work and the defense of his message. Help us to take these things into our hearts and apply them in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.